This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist, and we have our Cosmic Queries edition, a fan favorite. Chuck, you know hey. it's a fan favorite. They, they, they come, love it. They love it. They, they just love it. Love it. Inquiring minds want to know. That's what it comes down to. And we put out the expertise of our guest and what the topic is, and then we get flooded with questions. And today, We've got a colleague of mine, David Kipping, from up at Columbia University, Yay. In the, the, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. He has tapped roots from the UK at the Cambridge University and University College London, and he's he's part of what they call the Cool Worlds Lab. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask okay. him about that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So, are you are you cool or are you little, not? A little, little, little brag, little brag there, a little right. humble brag. A little humble you know? brag. Yeah, we deal with the cool worlds, baby. <laughs> <laughs> David, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, the, the name is is not supposed to be like dope planets or something. Yeah. That's, that's right. not what we're going for. <laughs> yeah. It really is cool, like well. actually temperature cool planets. But yeah. I appreciate that. We're, we're welcome to cool dope anyway. ass planets. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be one of us. <laughs> you wish you could. <laughs> I need some get that on it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, and you're no stranger to the uh, social media platforms. You've got your own YouTube channel that Ooh. has ne nearly a million. <laughs> subscribers dude nice keep it coming yeah keep, yeah that's uh that's all pandemic to to thank for that i think you know we just i've been making these videos for years and people just got into it recently let's let's not be um um uh, false falsely humble I mean, we, we, we can look at you, David. We know why it's happening. We, <laughs> no, it's, we can look right at you, David. No, no, no. We, we, see, the su we see the Superman swoop coming across your That's just this camera, Chuck. That's just this camera. Okay, we see it, David. We, we, we understand when, when With you're With a lock the of hair band. across the forehead. Yeah. Right, when you're okay. the boy band of physics. <laughs> There's a lot of filters happening here to make this happen. No, Chuck, the real issue here is most people just ate Cheetos and binged on TV shows, and he creates an entire YouTube empire in the Man, time. Yeah, right. nice. Right. Well, there it is. Wow. So let me ask you, David, so tell us, what are dope ass, what's the dope ass world's lab? <laughs> yeah, but, but, it's not we don't usually go by the name, but Cool World's Lab is, uh, it's it's the research team I started here at Columbia. So, you know, we, we there was a team called the Cool Stars Lab in uh, San Diego, I think, and, I thought that was a great name because obviously it's a fun play in words and everyone's interested in cool stars. Um, and as, as we've been discovering more and more planets, you know, we know of lots and lots of planets which are close to their stars, but it's the planets which are far away from their star where the temperatures are cool enough that we get really excited because then you have the possibility of liquid water or this kind of stuff. Cool is a relative term. So what would cool be? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Start, Let's quantify yeah. this, quantify mm. this. We're, we're deliberately vague in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no, like, if you're you know, 301 Kelvin, you're too hot, but 300 Kelvin, you're good. There's no hard, there's no hard line. It kind of depends on the science problem. You know, we, we're interested in moons. That's one of the big things we're interested in. That really doesn't directly have anything to do with temperature, but actually does kind of work out that way that when you're far away from the star, there's a better chance of moon. So yeah, but you're counting, wait, you're counting earth as being far away from the sun. In this, uh, in this, in this, vernacular. in this picture, there's, it's a cool world in this picture. We I would, would say. Be, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so why do we have so many exoplanets that are so close to their host star? That's What's just detection bias, unfortunately. I mean, oh, I wish it okay. wasn't true. Um, all right. Tell I mean, us about most... detection bias. Tell us about that. Because we hear about bias all the time yeah. and usually it's some psychological bias. Right. No yeah. one is <laughs> thinking that there could be actual scientific bias that has nothing to do right. with how whether you're a bigot. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're used to it happening at a traffic stop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so te tell us what you mean by a detection bias. Yeah, it's, it's not big to astronomers in this case. You know, that, that does sometimes happen, but that's not what's happening here. The, the, real, the real problem is that the, mo the most successful way of discovering planets is this transit method. As I'm sure you've talked about many times on Star Talk. The idea of as a planet eclipses in front of the star, it blocks out some of the starlight, and of course the star gets dimmer. But in order to get that chance alignment, uh, it's it's much much easier if the star and the is and the planet are very very close together. Oh, right. When you put them far apart, 
to get that chance alignment is kind of hard to show, but it's it's kind of improbable that the longer the axis is, the, the less likely is you're going to get that those two objects to line up. Okay. And so for that reason, so this is like looking for your are, car are away. looking for your car keys under the lamppost because that's where you're going to find them. So if you're going to look for planets, you're most likely to find just those planets that are close by, and they're so close that. They're very hot for being so close to their host star. I guess that's the problem. Unfortunately for me, I mean, some folks are fascinated by those hot planets. I, course, I'm yeah. obviously more interested in the cooler objects. On the possibility okay. of life, ultimately. In, in part. I mean, I, as I said, a big part of one of the reasons I lo love these things is just exotica can happen out here. You can have icy rings. You can mm. have exomoons. There's even a paper on the archive that will surely get debunked tomorrow claiming of a Trojan exoplanet at these kind of distances. So first, so tell everyone you... what the archive is, and then <laughs> tell us everyone about Trojan Trojan objects. There's a regular posting, um, an electronic repository called the archive, but it's archive with an X. And um, astronomers can post discoveries, papers that they have. Usually they've been through peer review, but sometimes like the paper that was up today, I don't think it had been peer reviewed yet. And there was a claim of, uh, two new planets, which happen to be in the same orbit as each other, which is- oh, which would Racetrack be style. Yeah. Racetrack. Yes. Yeah, they're yeah. chasing each other. So that's called yeah. a horseshoe orbit. And theoretically that's possible. Um, I just think a lot of us are pretty skeptical about the data for this particular case. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. all right. And so then you said something about exomoons? What, what we have that? rings, icy rings out mm -hmm. here, moons and liquid water, life. Um, I mean, there's, okay, the there's all thing. sorts of fun jazz that can happen the, once the you get far from the kit and the kaboom. Stars. That's why they're cool stars, of course. Exactly. Right. Cool worlds, yeah. Cool worlds. <laughs> Sorry, cool worlds. Right. All right, so Chuck, you got questions for this man? I do. Let's do As it. As usual, our people have come through for us. Let's jump right into it. Wait, just to be clear, these are Patreon members who have are at least the minimum membership level, right. which we reduced. Okay. Yes, we, we Just, dropped it down to $5 to give you no excuse. $5. Now you got no damn excuse. You got no excuse. $5 a month, a month and right. then you get to ask questions. Okay, go for That's it. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we go for a cool world. Uh, what's the largest planet that's ever discovered? And how large? I like that. Can I, a yeah. planet get conceivably? How Ooh. large could a planet get? Love I mean, that. You think, yeah, that makes sense because our sun isn't so big. So are there suns out there that are like super big and then they have super big planets around them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a yeah, correlation. Is the sun like, just like a having... planet around a bigger star? Right. <laughs> right. It right, passes right. on its genes almost. Yeah, not, not quite. So uh, let's let's track back. So for planets, usually uh, the biggest planet that was cold, if it was cool and there was no heat involved or anything like this, pretty much the biggest planet you can get is Jupiter-sized. You actually, uh, if you just spoon more mass onto Jupiter, it right. doesn't get any bigger. It just, it just gets more massive and its density increases, but its physical size doesn't really change. In fact, if anything, actually gets slightly smaller, mm. get the size that's slightly, slightly. Okay. Smaller. So often in the public, when people say big, they don't always know whether they're referring to size or mass. Right. I think right. those are those are conflated often when people are asking questions in the public. So you you make a very interesting point. You can increase the mass of Jupiter right. by spooning matter into it, and the extra gravity actually compresses the gas right. more than it otherwise would. Yeah. So the, I mean, in terms of the the maximum mass, let's go that. Let's just keep spooning mass on. Eventually, it'll become a star. Um, it kind of goes through this period of being a brown dwarf. But I think lots of us think well, brown dwarfs. That's kind of a made up category to some degree. It's effectively still just a type of Jupiter, some kind of super Jupiter. Right. And eventually when you start spooning enough mass on, you'll get to the critical point, which I think we can all agree something special happens, which is when hydrogen fusion occurs. There's enough pressure inside the, in the core of that object that hydrogen fusion occurs. And now you have a star. And that happens at about 80 Jupiter masses. You've been spooning more and more mass onto it. Uh -huh. So therefore the, the pressures down in the middle keep going up. Correct. Okay. So, so, so about 80, 80 times the mass of Jupiter. So, so Jupiter is not close to being a failed star. You know, people say Jupiter is right. a failed star. It has to be 80 times more, 80 times more mass to get. It's a, it's kind of a long way off, I would say, from being a failed star. But it, it has a similar size, physical size, to the smaller stars. That is true. Mm. Interesting. That is okay. Cool. That's really great. Jupiter already has more mass than all other planets combined. Right. But you're saying right. it could have been even more massive and we'd still call it a planet. And then 
nothing else matters in the solar system except the star and Jupiter. Like nothing. You know what yeah. I tell people, Chuck, that Jupiter is more bigger compared to Earth than Earth is compared to Pluto. Okay. So if you're on, if you're an Earthling and you want to say, let's get rid of Pluto's planet status, and you feel good about yourself. Right. If we were Jupiterians, we could feel the same way and kick Earth out and we'd have no recourse. Right. Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but also size does matter. Uh, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you, you. if you really want to get these plants big, you have to add heat. So you take one of these Jupiters and you you, you park it next to a really hot star. Or oh, then it puffs in, up. It puffs up. So oh. then you can get up to something like 170% the size of Jupiter, so 1.7 times larger. Probably not quite, I think, I don't think we have any ones that are twice as big, but they right. get pretty close to that so, limit. So, when a, really so a tad up. under twice the size of Jupiter is kind of our limits for planets, no matter where they are. As far as we know. I mean, okay. that's the fun thing about science. You never know. Someone might make a discovery tomorrow of a three, a three Jupiter sized planet. And, uh, you know, there's even ideas of dark matter planets. Dark matter planets would be extremely large probably larger right. than the sun in fact so you see now you're crazy. doing your own queries sir no, <laughs> you're doing question. your own queries because now we gotta know what a freaking dark matter planet oh, is i've never heard of this oh. that's amazing okay it's a hypothetical it's a hypothetical but dark matter doesn't like to clump you know it's it's very diffuse it interacts very weakly and so it's kind of hard to um, collapse it down, to cool it down as normal gases. When it when normal gas gets hot, it cools down, it radiates. And so it cools down and the gas collapses and eventually cools down to a point where you can actually start to form stars because the gas has, has concentrated gets, so much. Right. Dark matter doesn't really do that, but there are some varieties of dark matter models that allow for a bit more clumpiness. It's allowed to kind of interact a bit more strongly that could in extreme, it's a fairly extreme idea, but in some extreme versions, it could potentially form a dark matter planet, but it would be larger than the sun. Uh, it would, and mm. of order of, you know, just a few earth masses and it would be very weakly bound together. Uh. So it'd be a pretty, um, but then what right would you have to call it a planet? Just, just that that's for, I, I really don't care about it's the name. It's a gathering I, of I don't mass. Care. Yeah. Over here. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Yeah. I mean, okay. people, you talked about Pluto. I never get into that debate. I'm like, just yeah. call, it, call it whatever you want. I, I, it's interesting. It's an mm -hmm. interesting world. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. All, All right. right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more questions for David Kipping on, what, what did we call it? <laughs> Badass world. Oh, yeah. Dope ass world. Cool. Dope ass world. <laughs> 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 cool worlds among the exoplanets in our galaxy when Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk. Cosmic Queries, the Cool Worlds edition, with the founder of the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia University, David Kipping. Uh, so David, what? how many people are part of this lab? Let's see, we have, I have three graduate students right now, um, and at any one time, there's somewhere between sort of three and six undergraduates. It's sort of this is a sort okay. of stochastic variation in that sense. All right. Good. So this yeah. you just you just invented this out of whole cloth. Yeah, yeah. I also have an editor as well for my videos because the whole there's a whole separate thing of the videos we make on on YouTube. Got so it, I work got with, it. Uh, and he, you know he he edits my videos, but isn't involved in the research directly. And yeah. what's the name of your channel? Just cool worlds. That's just cool it. worlds. YouTube I wasn't channel. very creative. I had this one great idea for a name, and I just kept using it. Okay, just you should have come to me and Chuck. We would have said dope ass, dope -ass planets. Dope, dope ass dope. planets. <laughs> we could have. We totally could have hooked you up. You know, call next time. All <laughs> Need right? a time machine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chuck, you got more questions from our Patreon uh, supporters. Yep, let's do it from Patreon. This is Richard Hart, and Richard says. Richard here from Elk Grove, California. Looking at Hano Rain's exoplanet app, there are more than 300 planets noted in the habitable zone of their stars, of which a vast majority of them are at least half the mass of Jupiter or bigger, sir. Is this just a result of how we're currently detecting planets, or do you think it's a potentially common occurrence for a gas giant to be in the habitable zone of its star? Oh, I like that. That's a Ooh, good question, good and question. it kind of makes sense the way he poses it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's definitely something we're excited about. And it, it rings true. I mean, you have to be careful when you, you look at this these catalogs, like on the app or on, on NASA Exoplanet Archive. It's another great website if you want to go through all of these yourself. I'm not sure if Hanno is still updating that app anymore. So it might, I'm sure there's even more actually past that. But you have the, to total, be the total exoplanets are over 5,000. Seems to me we, should, we would have more than 300 in a Goldilocks zone, you'd think. Yeah, Possibly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, but in any case, uh, that you have to be careful because of all these biases, you know, these detection biases that you're only, you're only ever seeing a fraction of the true, the true number. Right, so right. people have done the calculation of correcting for that bias to actually figure out how many planets are there really in this temperate zone. And it turns out that you're right, that there are a, a, a surprisingly large number, about 50% of all sun-like stars, FGK type stars, we call them sun-like stars, they have planets with radii in between about twice that of the Earth all the way up to the biggest Jupiter. So the, all of those are gas giants, mini mini gas giants, Neptunes, mini Neptunes, super Neptunes, Saturns, Jupiters, So that's all of even that. correcting for the observer's bias? Correct, half okay. of all stars have gaseous planets in the habitable zone, which, which obviously don't have solid surfaces. Wait, 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 wait. That's something different from what you said. I, I thought half of all planets in the habitable zones are that size. You're saying half of all stars. Correct. Ha oh my God, that's a whole lot. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot. lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's They're another, very common. Another. That's from Kepler's statistics. Uh, for, for Earth's, we Kepler, don't the even know what the answer is. Telescope designed specifically for these discoveries, yeah. Correct, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, not the NASA mission that flew, what was it, 2009 to 2014, 15. Sure. So we, we know that um, there are lots and lots of those gaseous plants which could have moons, and that's why we're so excited to look for them. And in fact, there may even be far more than Earth-sized planets at that distance. We, we actually don't know what the number is of how many Earths there are at that distance yet. So wow. if, so you like the moons because they give, you like moons of gaseous planets because they give you a surface to hang out on. Right. Right. I mean, th there could be there could be more habitable moons than habitable planets in the universe. Other aliens could be looking at us thinking, what's going on over there? Why are they living on a planet? Like most of us live on moons. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's why they're not interested in us. We're like, we're just these weird guy people living on a planet. I'm going to uh, say that's the one cool thing that I like about Star Wars when it comes to how they envision other worlds and galaxies, solar systems, is that often... You're, they're going to a moon of a planet. They're not going to that planet. Yeah. It's whatever system, but then where they're actually landing is a moon itself. You know. Yeah. I would. Yeah, I would great. also add that the host planet is going to look way better in the sky right. from a moon than the moon is from the planet. Just true. thought I'd yeah, tell you that. Yeah. Just imagine Saturn in the night sky, just, just looming large. Wow. It just that would just be totally cool. That is cool. Yeah. yeah. I always wonder how history would be different um, had we had that happen to us. Like, how would we discover the laws of physics differently? Celestial mechanics, uh, the Ke Kepler's laws of motions. Would the presence of such a large body in our sky accelerate it? Would it decelerate it? Um, obviously, there's all this kind of radio stuff flying off uh, Jupiter as well. Would that affect the technology we develop on our home planet, our home world even? So, uh, it's 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 ripe for science fiction. That's why Star Wars has so much fun with it. So I think about it the opposite way, David. If we evolved on the surface of Venus, which is a very thick cloud cover, and it would just get sort of get light in the day and dark at night, but mm. you wouldn't know. Mm. How long, how much delayed would astronomy have been? Yeah. Because you'd have no idea what's going on outside of this fog, this and, cloud. And we cover. would yeah. all have seasonal affective disorder. No, <laughs> is that right? So, you know, it'd be like, look up. Why? <laughs> For what? So sad. I'm yeah. just... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chuck, keep him coming. All right, let's go to Matthew Power. And uh, what a great name, Matthew Power. Uh, since some planets in our solar system have higher concentrations of certain elements, iron on Mars, for example, does that suggest our original solar nebula, once flattened by a centri centrifugal force, may have been ring-like with bands of certain elements that eventually formed the planets? Sort of a solar system-sized version of Saturn's rings. Oh, I like that. Wow. Because that, that would mean that different places within the ring 
would coalesce to form a planet and, and have a very different concentration from other places in the disk. So how does that all land with you, David? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. In terms of iron abundance, um, I'm not. I'm actually. I've not heard that before. That Mars has a higher iron abundance than the Earth. I know Especially, Mercury wins. Mercury. Mercury does. definitely does. I know huge for sure iron Mercury core. Does. Right. But Mercury is somewhat of a strange case. Usually, the explanation we evoke for making sense of what's going on with Mercury is. I mean, generally, we kind of assume that all the planets formed with roughly the same amount of iron, at least in a relative sense compared to their mass. But Mercury does seem to have a lot more iron than the other planets in a relative right. sense. And so our, our explanation for that is that it was basically struck by many, many meteorites with such high velocity, such high energy, they actually chipped away the, the outer layer of Mercury. So you're saying it chips away pieces of Mercury that then just gets jettisoned into the solar system? Never to or, return. or even just vaporized uh, to some degree from the impact and then and then leaked off as as vapor. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's also possible. So it's, it's um, like cosmic exfoliation. Well, that's how very good. Working. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a chemical peel for yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> almost for the planet. So that probably explains we think why Mercury has higher iron abundance. But generally, you assume that for the rest of the planets, it is uniform. And in fact, that is often treated as a default assumption when we look at other exoplanets. We assume so that there's- You don't know for every sure about Mars though. We're not quite sure, you're not quite sure. I, I'm not sure, I'm not mm -hmm. sure, I've never heard that before. So I'd have to fact check that, that Mars, I always like to be honest when, I don't, when I've not heard something before. I've never heard the fact that Mars has a higher iron abundance than the earth. I'd be somewhat surprised if it's true because I just, from my expertise of looking at exoplanets, I know that many of my colleagues explicitly assume that the iron abundance is uniform throughout any given solar system, with exceptions like Mercury. We can't deny Mars the fact that it's red because of iron, iron. In, a, in its outer crust. Mm. I mean, everywhere. That's pretty much just a rusty place. Right. So, but I, yeah, I think, I think that's partly due to the, the unique history of that planet and its, its okay. distinct chemical environment and the oxidation yeah. that mm -hmm. happened on its surface that is different from Earth and Venus. You implied something that I want to tease out here because it's, it's a very important scientific tool, really, that you can make an assumption about, you can make a reasonable assumption about how much iron you'd expect in all of the planets based on the iron that's in the sun, because the iron, the sun has most of the mass of the solar system. Then when the, if the iron differs from that, you get to then look for an explanation for that, Correct. which is a fascinating way to land on a new problem. We did, we did that with the moon. The moon has hardly any iron. Yeah. So how do you be, get, become an object that big with no iron? That, mm. So then we looked and we thought about it, and then we came with the collision hypothesis mm -hmm. for, yeah. for the moon. So it's fun when something falls out of your expectations. You, it, you get novel accountings for the- but that, That's actually why I don't like this, uh, this strategy that many of my colleagues have of assuming explicitly that the iron abundance in the star is the same as the planets. Because as you just point out, there's already two counter examples right there. And there's, there's probably even more throughout the solar no, no, system. I, no, so, I get that. But w if it is different, then you get to look for why it's different. Rather true, than but we, say- we, In exoplanets, we have no way of true. directly measuring the iron abundance, at least not yet. I mean, okay. I, I, don't, I think the only way to do that would be if the if the planet was so hot, it was like Mustafar from Star Wars. It was like a lava world where the rock was literally gaseous. And then you could then you could infer the composition of, of the rock from the atmosphere. But barring that, we have no way of measuring the chemical composition of what's inside. Uh, how about I Io around Jupiter? Aren't there active volcanoes there? Could you get some Yeah, iron? that's a good example. So yeah, yeah, kind of like a Mustafa-ish type system, right? Where you have yeah. extreme volcanism where you can mm -hmm. spew up the gases and then you get a chance of sampling, sampling what was them. inside. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You need that, yeah. All right. That's, that's pretty wild. All right, Chuck, give me another. All right, all right. Blowing through all right, these. All right. This is Christian Holmes, who says, Greeting, Dr. Tyson and Professor Kipping. Quick question. What is the most extreme exoplanet that's been observed? Thank you, Christian from Pennsylvania. Now, Christian does not qualify the word extreme. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know exactly what he means, but yeah. maybe David, you, you can take liberty with that. Okay, I, I, let me sharpen that question and say, David, you presumably have catalogs of exoplanets now. There's more than 5,000. So mm -hmm. presumably they, they line up with each other in ways that reveal similarities. 
Is there an outlier among the 5,000 that you, that ha, where nobody else looks like it? Woo. I think this, it's hard to pick on one that there's, there's several plants, which, which come to mind in this case. Um, one is one I helped kind of discover its weirdness of immediately comes to mind because it got so much press attention when we released it. It was like 10 years ago now. And it was called Trays 2B. And we called it Erebus, the darkest world. Erebus was the god of darkness, I think, in Greek mythology. Oh, uh, yes. Maybe it was Roman mythology. But we, we, called, it, we <laughs> called it that. I, I'm Wait, David, you, the truth. you didn't say it, it, it right. It, Chuck has to say it. No, Erebus. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, Erebus. Erebus. <laughs> Erebus. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, you should, you should do all the, all the press work for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this, this planet is darker than coal. It's darker than black paint. It reflects less light than basically any material you can come across. Except Vanta black? For, except for Vanta black. Except for Vanta black. Okay. That, but we don't know. It might be as dark as Vanta black. We only have an upper wow. limit on its darkness. It Wait, what is Vanta black? darker than Vanta black, as far as we can tell. W wow. What is Vanta black? It's the uh, least reflective material that we know of to date. So it is. it has uh, an albedo of nothing no <laughs> near zero i guess yeah, yeah almost okay. zero but the, wait yeah. wait so david if it doesn't reflect any light how do you know it's there from transits it still casts a shadow oh. it still casts a shadow so oh. as it passes in front of the star it still now that's out light. a dope ass world <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm talking about oh. right. <laughs> that's a shadow but it's very dark so when it when it passes around when it passes in front of the star it blocks out light when it passes behind the star we call that the occultation event, you get kind of a moment where you get to detect photons from the planet, light from the planet. So I can take a picture just here, just before the planet passes behind. And now I'm getting light from the planet and light from the star. And I, oh. I take a photo of the two. And then I take a photo when it's behind. And now I've just got light from the star by itself. So subtract one from the other, and you've got light from the planet in isolation. And that that's is what we brilliant. call an occultation. So that's how, that's we, that's how we're able to brilliant. tell that. God, I gotta love science. I know. <laughs> you science gotta is... love it. I mean, well, who thinks of this crap? It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, just a, a, a small fact in there that it's very dangerous to subtract and explore the difference between two large numbers. So you, you're very. Yeah. So, David, your confidence in that, in those results. Uh, you have to you have to be very sure that you're getting what you're looking for there, correct? That's right, but it's not my first radio, Neil. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. But it's and, a general and it's been thing confirmed by others. Others after me published uh, subsequent work that ended up in the same result. So we feel pretty confident Excellent. about that result. So Chuck, you yeah. notice it's not him reconfirming his own results because what good would that be? Right. right. The whole point of peer review and and multiple studies. That's how science moves. Science loves the haters, baby. Yes, we do. Science yeah. loves the haters. It's like, go ahead and hate on me. No, they're not really haters. They're doing it out of love. Of course, <laughs> of course they are. They okay. will try to show you're wrong Let me you. because they love you. There you go. Or they love science. Yeah. They love science, yeah. Well, the truth is, in a way, it is kind of loving because in, in trying to show somebody's wrong, you end up confirming their work. And that ends up showing them love. So yeah, yeah. that's it, yeah, yeah. That's love. So, cool. All right. All right. One more, Chuck, before right, we take our we second break. Okay, here we go. Uh, long ago, I was impressed by a professional. Oh, this is Gene, and Gene is just Gene. Okay. Uh, he goes. Long ago, I was impressed by a professional astronomer who was studying eclipsing binary stars. I was and am amazed by how much info one can extract with careful measurements and clever bootstrapping. Now we are using the same techniques on exoplanets and the James Webb Space Telescope add spectral measurements of atmospheres. Could you give a brief summary of what and how we can get details from eclipsing systems? So, you know. We're talking about all of it, not just one yeah. exoplanet going in front of the star, but the whole system. The whole star system. All right. That's, that's whatever, however long it's going to take him to answer, we don't have time in this segment. So let's take a break. <laughs> when we come back, we'll get the full explanation of how the methods, tools, and tactics of eclipsing binary stars have been lifted and adopted and modified in the service of David Kipping's dope-ass 
uh, planet. <laughs> yeah, dope-ass <laughs> <department. laughs> dope <ass world. laughs> But when Star Talk Cosmic Queries continues. We're back. Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Cool Worlds edition with David Kipping, who started his own Cool Worlds group at Columbia's Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Columbia University, that is. Uh, David, you've got your 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 successful and growing uh, uh, YouTube called Cool Worlds. Uh, what else? Tell me more about your social media footprint. Uh, the thing we're starting, and uh, it's not it's not live yet, is the Cool Worlds podcast, which I've recorded, I think, seven episodes of. We have seven episodes in the in the tank, and I'm just really excited to start sharing those. So as soon as we get that out, you can look on all the major platforms you get your podcast for, the Cool Worlds podcast. Excellent, excellent. And I, you're on Twitter? Yes, David underscore Kipping is me on Twitter. So we left off. Tell me the chap's name, Chuck. Gene. Gene. Well, that could be boy or girl. It could so be. we do not know the gender. So Gene wanted to know... What methods, tools, and tactics were borrowed from eclipsing binaries that to serve your cottage industry of, of cold worlds? Yeah, an enormous amount. I mean, there's, in fact, so many astronomers moved from that field of eclipsing binaries into the study of planets directly. That was the transition around the mid-90s when we first started finding planets. There's a really beautiful quote um, from Henry Norris Russell from 1953, I think he wrote this, that uh, eclipses are the royal road to success. And they're, they're kind of a shortcut. They provide you, it's almost like a cheat code in the universe. For some, for some reason, when these eclipses happen, it's possible to learn so much more about these planets than your technology would seem to enable. Like we can measure potentially the existence of, of moons, as we've already talked about. You can measure the atmosphere of the planets. You could look for rings. You could even measure the ablateness, whether it's spherical or football-shaped of a planet from those light curves. You can uh, measure the surface reflectivity, as we've talked about, these dark planets. There's an almost endless list of, of wonderful gems. The, the eclipses also enable you to see light from the star move through the atmosphere and then do spectroscopic studies. Correct. And that's what, gases. of course, we're all excited about with JWST is uh, enabling. Um, so essentially, when the plant passes in front, the same thing as the plant passes in front of the star, some of the light will we'll hit the bulk of the planet, if you like, and hit the solid surface. And that's never going to reach us. That's the shadow. But some of it will pass through the atmosphere. And if it passes through the atmosphere, only a fraction of it will reach us. And the fraction which reaches us will be different at different wavelengths, different colors. So our sky is blue. And so the Earth's atmosphere looks bigger in blue light. It scatters blue more than it scatters red. So an alien looking at the Earth and measuring our size would think that the Earth was a little bit bigger at blue wavelengths of light than it was in red wavelengths of light because of Raleigh scattering, because our sky is blue. And they'd even be able to tell that from afar and go a bit further. You can get the chemicals, you can get oxygen, you can get uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen. So you can actually figure out a lot about it. All from, from eclipses. Afar. Henry Norris Russell was at one point the chair of the Department of Astrophysics at Princeton University. That's Henry right. Norris yeah. Russell. And uh, those, the real geeks out there, might have heard of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. That's the same Russell uh, yeah. for, for that diagram. You can mm. Google it, Her Hertzsprung Russell yes. diagram. Okay. Yeah. HR diagram for short, uh, the affectionate term for mm. it. So Gene was right to realize that this trove of information brought to us from eclipsing binaries w continues in the field of exoplanets whenever you have eclipses. There's a legacy, but it goes even beyond that. I mean, when you look at the theory that we, we borrowed from eclipse and binaries, and I studied this, like Copal uh, was one of the founders of understanding elliptical orbits and modeling the durations of the eclipses, uh, the timing procession, the secular, all this kind of complicated stuff from mechanics was all figured out for eclipse and binaries. So we took that and we still use it in exoplanets, but then we've gone further because of course we're measuring atmospheres, we're in planetary atmospheres and stars, they have, atmospheres, but they're not nearly as interesting as the atmospheres of plants and all the rich chemical molecular uh, chemistry that can happen inside them. So uh, I don't I'd think say the stars would agree with you on that. I think they have they have just dissed <laughs> stellar atmospheres, but go on. Well, I, may be, I may be biased, but I <laughs> yeah, think no. the plants are infinitely, infinitely uh, more complex than stars. We actually understand stars far better than we understand plants. You know, there's, there's 
we don't really understand what's going on inside the most plants or how their atmospheres work, how clouds work even on mm-hmm. other plants. But mm-hmm. you know, we feel like we have a fairly good understanding of the interior of stars. Right, because clouds can be made of things other than water vapor, right? right? Yeah, you can have methane right. clouds, methane right? Clouds. Yeah. Your Which, uh, by the way, I, I produce daily. No, <laughs> just in case anybody's wondering. Okay, no smoking around Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I am a fire hazard. <laughs> All right, keep them coming, Chuck. All right, here we go. Um, here we go. This is Kyla Hunter. And Kyla says, hello, Dr. Tyson and Professor Kipping. Could the asteroid and Kuiper belts be considered rings of the sun? Mm. Mm. So you got the asteroid belt, the yeah. belt. Well, Saturn has rings, and right. it's flat, and it's all around. And so we got these two belts here. What are you thinking, David? Yeah, I mean, a rocky ring, sure, sure, you could call them that. I mean, it is possible that plants could have rocky rings. So if you're going to call rocky rings around plants rings, I don't see why you couldn't call rocky ring structures around stars the same thing. Sure, uh, you know. It, it, it's the question is how concentrated does it get? Because normally they form right. almost like discs rather than or an, annuli. They're, they're not often uh, so narrow. So it, I guess it depends on your on your structure. There is actually an exoplanet that was discovered that has a, a, a ring system that forces us to ch- tackle this weird thing of definition. It was um, it was discovered by the Watts survey. I think it was like J fourteen oh seven B was the name, and it has a, a ring system. That is well, but just WASP about, is is it's a planet survey, right? So the, correct, it's what, just small cameras. It's just small. Yeah, it's, small, it's, it's a consortium of small cameras. And what is the acronym? It's um, Wide Area Search for Planets, something like that. That is sounds that? right. I, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm not even sure. We all call it yeah. WASP. I yeah. was going to say. I was um, going to say maybe they're just white cameras. <laughs> WASP <laughs> cameras, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's from yeah. these acronyms. We all f- forget where they come from eventually. Yeah, this this particular planet discovered by WASP uh, has this gigantic ring system uh, that that is about the same. It's about one AU across. That's about the Earth's orbit around the Sun. It's like that's how large the ring structure around this exoplanet is. So this this exoplanet is very very far from its star, and it has a gargantuan sized ring system. And there's huge cavities in it. It, and you know, we're, you know I've we're seen artist illustrations of this now that you're mentioning it. Yeah, it's a stunning thing. How does it's it keep bizarre. a stable ring while it's orbiting the star? It's it's very we don't even know if it is orbiting the star. There's only one eclipse of this thing ever seen, which is where the evidence for the rings come from. It may not it may have just been a chance <laughs> coincidence that it passed in front wow. of a star. And it was free floating, as far as we know. Okay, interesting. It could be a brown dwarf. It could even be a small star, perhaps. So there's a there's an awful lot we don't know about this particular case. We just have this one snapshot with this rich, uh, apparent like ring system, and that's a good point where we don't know. It's so different to Saturn. What do you call that? Is it a, a planetary ring system, or is it a circumplanetary disk, which is a high, a completely different category normally of of how we think about these things that evolve around planets. So what Jupiter, when it formed its moons, probably at one point had a disk around it. And from that disk formed the moons. Is this something like that? Or is it more like something like an ancient ring system, more similar to Saturn? And so uh, it, it's hard. Classification is hard. And I, if you want to classify the, 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 you know, the asteroid belt that way, I, I wouldn't dismiss it. Yeah. I think that's a fair way to call it. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. All right. Chuck, we got time for a few more. Okay, let's go with Alan Rayer. Uh, what are the major interesting astronomical events that we can expect with respect to exoplanets for the coming year? I'd love it, that. Yeah. Mm. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then he says, uh, "Hi, I'm from Lithuania, Chuck. You probably already killed my last name, but no. <laughs> and you're probably right, but you didn't give me a phonetic spelling, so <laughs> you're so give you're, it. Give us that last name again. You're Alan Rayer." Or Ryer, R A Y E R, R A Y E R. Yeah, Rayer, Rayer, Ryer, one or the other. But but what's what's coming down the pike? I mean, that, Kipping. What 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 can we look forward to? Yeah. That might be exciting. More space there, missions. There's a bunch or, of stuff. Just you there's, guys on Earth. The, I, I'm excited. Let's see what I'm excited about. There's obviously JWST is in the sky observing exoplanets right now, and it's observing Trappist One, which is one of the most 
fascinating exopatric systems we've ever discovered. It, it probably won't be sensitive enough to detect signs of life on those planets, but it could perhaps tell us whether these planets have an atmosphere that is similar. And these are rocky planets in the habitable zone of their stars. It could tell us whether these planets have um, an atmosphere similar to a primordial Earth when the Earth was first born, it was probably a CO2 rich atmosphere. It could detect that quite easily. It could detect a methane rich atmosphere. It probably can't go all the way to detecting oxygen on these planets, but it's going to be our first glimpse of the chemical composition of a habitable rocky planet's atmosphere. And that, that's going to come in the next year, two years from JDRST. Wait, how many? Isn't that a multi planet system? How many planets there's, are in that There's Trappist seven, system? at least seven. Crazy. Earth size, in fact, slightly sub Earth sized planets Crazy. in that system. Oh. Uh, the seven dwarfs, they're all packed very, very close to this M dwarf, all within the uh, orbit of Mercury, I think, or seven mm -hmm. of them. So, very, very compact system. Wow. Um, so, that's very exciting. Then we have uh, Plato, which is a European mission, which is coming down the pipe. I think that's Plato? 20. Plato, yeah, after Plato. the. After the philosopher, yeah, so okay. that's in 2026, I think we're expecting a launch. That's like a a super Kepler or even a super test. These are two missions which NASA launched to hunt for planets by eclipses. Plato is doing the same thing on steroids. And yeah. then down the road, we have, from that we have a uh, W first, uh, which is this old spy satellite which was given to NASA, and it's basically a Hubble sized uh, mirror. The, the the NSA were just like we don't we don't need this anymore because it's such old technology you can have it and do something with it so we we've repurposed it and launching it as a, basically a Hubble class telescope that will do all sorts of stuff including some exoplanet science uh, wow. using a technique called gravitational microlensing so it, it should find thousands of objects using this technique so we're very excited about that and then of course you've got Vera Rubin uh, formerly known as LSST. Um, which is not really an exoplanet mission per se, but I think it could do some interesting things in terms of detecting planets around white dwarf stars. So the sun will eventually become a white dwarf star when it dies. And LSST, we wrote a paper about that in my team, we think could be the perfect telescope to detect thousands of rocky planets, even smaller than that, even asteroid-sized things around these white dwarfs. Well, you know what? That brings us to Captain James Riley, who... Uh, just as a perfect follow-up to everything you just said. If we found biosignatures on an exoplanet, what would be our next course of action considering Ooh, like they're it. so far away? I like uh -huh. it. So what, like what do it. you do? You, you're the, the dog that caught the car. Mm -hmm. So the, well, the immediate the reaction I would have, the immediate reaction I have would be skepticism <laughs> because I think we're all going to be dubious. So the first is, is it real? Because we had a biosignature detection already on Venus. Right, remember that there was phosphine. I remember that phosphine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know that—that's the reaction that played out after that is probably similar to the reaction that will play out for an exoplanet. Obviously, it's—it's it's a very. We can actually visit Venus. We could actually potentially go there and do a better job. But the skepticism that 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 happened, I think, will be similar to the skepticism that happens with an exoplanet claim. Well, just in all fairness to the Venus skepticism, the. That would have been life somehow thriving in Venus's atmosphere, whereas these other signatures would presumably indicate surface life. Right? Also, I mean, we won't even know. I mean, if we detect a biosignature, we don't know where that life is. It could be in the ocean and right, the gas right. has come up. It could be on the surface. Mm -hmm. It could be some kind of whale that that floats through the clouds. You know, there's okay. we just there's no way of telling from the gases mm -hmm. alone. Um, an, an air whale, yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> Why not? Blow, knock yourself out. You can have you know, any kind of life you Floating want device, to explain the biosignature. Yeah. And in fact, it might not. So the two questions: Is it really? Is the signal real? Can another team get it? Which has obviously been some problems with Venus with phosphine. And then two: Even if it is real, does that actually mean it's life? Because there are ways that nature can produce biosignatures without biology and just and just trip you up. So there'll be a north, there'll be a decade of arguing and follow-up observations and debates and it'll, it'll get heated of people trying to figure out what's really going on and there'll be some false starts. I guarantee you there'll be several biosignature claims that will just not be real, but that's okay. That's how science works. Science works through. We're not dogmatic. It's corrective. We're allowed to make mistakes and fix it, and that's that's science at its healthiest. So just expect that down the road. Um, but eventually, uh, yeah, it would be great if we could 
one day start imaging these planets, maybe building something like Louvoir or Habex that people have been talking about, these kind of supersized telescopes that could image the pale blue dots from many light years away, you know, achieve Sagan's dream of a pale blue dot from, from across an entirely different star system. And then after that, uh, we'll be trying to just learn more and more about it. Does it have moons? You know, what's, what's the continental structure like? How much water does it have? We'll do as much as we can remotely. And perhaps in the distant future, we might be able to send something, but it's, it's certainly not something within our capabilities uh, in the near future. All right, Chuck, I don't know if we have time for any more. I think we're done here. Uh, a lot, Dave, lot, lot more uh, questions might have to come and do a part two. Yeah, yeah. Happy David, to do so, yeah, guys. You, yeah, you have fulfilled our expectation that these are dope ass worlds. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> we'll have to rename the, the you know have to rename the whole team. I think after this start. dope ass world, <laughs> dope ass world. All right, David. Great to know you're just up the street from us at Columbia yeah. University. It's my alma mater, uh, my PhD alma mater. I have very fond memories and affection for the place and the department. So say hi to everybody there who knows me. Well, we saw you just two days ago. It'll, right? it'll be, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We see you here often, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, Chuck, good to have you, man. Always a pleasure. All right, Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up. <laughs>